Throughout human history, countless people have met their end in the most disturbing manners possible. Some examples, however, stand out, likely due to the cruelty or agonizing manner of their demise. In today's video, we will look at three of the more disturbing cases of how one might shuffle off this mortal coil. Our first example will be the brutal execution of Robert Francois Damiens. This would-be assassin attempted to kill King Louis XV of France in 1757, and for this he was tortured and executed as if he had succeeded. Just why Robert attempted to kill the King of France is unknown, yet his death remains one of the more gruesome examples of torture and execution. Robert's life prior to his botched assassination attempt appeared perfectly ordinary. He had spent much of his life working as a domestic servant, moving from job to job and establishing a family. During the 1740s, Robert moved from job to job more frequently, developing erratic behaviours and eventually stealing from his employers. At a time estranged from his family, he was noted for speaking to himself at night, bleeding himself to remove bad blood and drinking heavily. On the 5th of January 1757, as the king was making his way to his coach at the Versailles Palace, Robert made his move. He made his way through the king's guards and collided into the king. At this point, Robert stabbed King Louis with a small pocket knife before making his escape. Initially, the king believed that he had been merely punched. It was only when he went to touch the site of the impact did he feel and see blood. Louis suffered a shallow wound between his ribs, but was otherwise unharmed. Robert didn't stab the king multiple times, and thanks to the king's thick winter clothing, he remained largely unharmed. Robert was soon apprehended, and was taken away to be tortured. It was thought that Robert might be part of a larger conspiracy to assassinate the king. It was suspected that Robert could be part of a Jesuit Catholic Reformation group, or that he was acting on behalf of the high courts, as both groups did have issues with the king. Although no such definitive motive was established and no other members of a conspiracy were found, the evidence that did exist for this was largely focused on his work as a domestic servant for a Jesuit college. During his 50 interrogations, he stated he had planned to kill the king some three years prior and that his inspiration for the attempted assassination was from everyone around him, not a particular source. No consideration was paid as to his mental state prior to the attack, and much emphasis was placed on the possibility of some greater political conspiracy. Even though the attack didn't kill the king, Robert was condemned as if he had. His execution was to be a grand show of the consequences of striking against the divinely appointed monarch. On the 2nd of March 1757, he was brought before the crowds to be executed. Before his death, Robert's flesh was ripped from his body. Specially made pincers were used to tear the flesh from his arms, chest, thighs and calves. Once the flesh had been removed, a mixture of molten lead, boiling oil and melted wax was poured onto his skin. It was reported that Robert cried out in a manner that greatly disturbed those who were present. The executioner responsible for administering the punishment struggled to remove the flesh at times, needing to make multiple twisting wrens to rip away the desired amount. The next step was to deal with a hand that dared to strike the king. It was burned with sulphur, however the flames used were of a low heat, meaning only the top layers of skin were burned away. And finally, ropes were tied to Robert's arms and legs, and he was to be pulled apart by four horses in different directions, in what is termed as quartering. However, the attempt was botched. The horses pulling were not able to pull him apart. After 15 minutes, two more horses were added, but still, the desired outcome was not achieved. It was then decided that Robert's thighs were to be cut to ease the process. It was only when the flesh had been cut to the bone that Robert's limbs came away. When the priests went to attend to Robert, he was declared dead, yet some accounts insist that he was still alive, even when his broken body was tossed into the fire to be burned to ash. Robert's execution was brutal, his body desecrated and destroyed for all to see. 
It is a disturbing example of the punishments inflicted against those who committed treason, regicide, or stabbing of a king. Robert's execution encapsulates the power wielded by the monarchy and the extreme deterrence employed to maintain it. Our next example is that of Balthasar Gerard, the man who assassinated William the Silent. To kill a member of royalty was seen as an affront to God, as such people were believed to rule through divine right. Such acts of regicide would invite the most severe of punishments. So why did Gerard set out to kill William the Silent? In the late 1500s, William the Silent was a leading proponent of Protestant Reformation and rebelled against Spanish control in the Netherlands. William sought to increase the power held by the Dutch nobility and to put an end to the prosecution of Protestants by the Catholic Spanish rulers. In 1581, the provinces of the Netherlands declared independence from Spanish rule. That same year, the King of Spain issued a significant bounty for the head of William the Silent, and he was declared a traitor to the Catholic faith. Gerard set about on attempting to claim the bounty. He first joined the Luxembourgian army, in hopes of getting close to William, though such a meeting never materialised. It would not be until 1584 that Gerard re-attempted his plan in earnest. After failing to secure funding from a Spanish backer, he instead presented himself to William. He feigned he was the son of a martyred Protestant from France fallen on hard times, receiving a sum of money as a donation. Instead of buying the clothing he claimed he needed, Gerard bought a pair of flintlock pistols. On the 10th of July, Gerard returned to the Prinzenhof Palace, waiting for William in the shadows. As William ascended the stairs, Gerard ambushed and fired two shots into the prince's chest. As William lay dying, Gerard attempted to make his escape. He had planned to jump into the moat and swim to a waiting horse. He however stumbled, and he was caught by the palace guards. As he was dragged away under a rain of fists and sword hilts battering him, he professed his loyalty to the King of Spain. William the Silent bears the ill title of the first head of state assassinated with a firearm. When Gerard was brought before the courts for his crime, he expressed no regret or remorse for the killing. He in fact compared himself to David with the prince being Goliath. His trial was short and he was quickly sentenced to death, but not before a prolonged period of torture. The magistrates issued a number of punishments to be carried out before Gerard's heart was to be ripped and thrown in his face. Gerard was first hung on a pole where he received lashing after lashing. He was then taken down and had his wounds smeared with honey. A goat was then brought in and encouraged to lick these honey smeared wounds. Goats have an extremely coarse tongue, capable of ripping away flesh. In perhaps the only small mercy to be shown to Gerard, the goat refused to play its part. Gerard's hands were then forced into a vat of boiling oil. At night time, Gerard had his hands and feet bound together in a painful stress position, tied into a ball, making sleep incredibly difficult. Gerard was made to wear shoes made of uncured dog leather that were far too small for his feet. His feet were then held to a fire, resulting in the leather contracting and crushing his feet. Once the crumpled shoes were removed from his crumpled feet, so too was the skin that had melted and fused into the leather. Boiling bacon fat was poured over Gerard, scorching his flesh. With his battered, burned and shredded body in tatters, he was made to wear clothing doused in alcohol. After three days and nights of excruciating torture, Gerard was finally executed. First, his right hand was burned off with hot iron and had flesh torn from his body in six places. Gerard was then quartered and disemboweled, all whilst clinging on to life. Finally, as decreed in his sentence, Gerard's heart was ripped from his chest and thrown into his face. The final step was to remove his head, which was later displayed on a pike at the site of the assassination. His arms and legs were then put on four gates of the city. The King of Spain provided the bounty to Gerard's parents, along with lands and peerage, in light of Gerard being unable to claim it. 
William's death did little to stop the cause for Dutch independence or Protestant Reformation. His family continued as the monarchy for the Netherlands, and so did the Dutch Revolt continue well into the 1600s. As for Gerard, he is remembered less for his actions and more for the grisly end he met as a result. And finally, we have the Byford Dolphin Accident. On the 5th of November 1983, five saturation divers working on the Byford Dolphin met a truly disturbing end. A catastrophic, explosive decompression killed five and injured one. Just how such a disaster could happen is a tragic tale. It is perhaps helpful to start with an explanation of saturation diving. When one dives at extreme depths, the body will experience many atmospheres of pressure. This pressure compresses the gases in the body and can result in nitrogen being absorbed into the blood. If one returns to the surface too quickly and as the pressure decreases, there is not enough time for the nitrogen to leave the body safely. When this happens, the nitrogen forms bubbles that lead to decompression sickness or the bends. This can cause severe pain, dizziness or even a stroke. Divers therefore take precautions and slowly return to the surface to avoid the bends. Though for divers working at the deepest, darkest depths of 300 meters, repairing or fitting oil pipelines, it would not be economically viable for them to take the time needed after every dive. If such divers were to slowly ascend with long pauses, it would take them days to safely reach the surface. The solution to this is saturation diving, where divers complete the dive and return to the surface in a pressurized diving bell. This bell then connects to a pressurized chamber that matches the pressure of the dive where sat divers will spend their off time. This can be for as much as 28 days at a time. The body can only absorb so much nitrogen, meaning the time to decompress won't increase exponentially. Once their time is finished, they can take the time needed to safely decompress. Living in such a saturation diving chamber means carefully maintaining the pressure as a sudden change can be catastrophic. This was the case for the men of the Byford Dolphin. The chamber was located on the drilling rig in the Frigg gas field of Norway. Those living in the chamber were Edwin Arthur Coward, Roy P. Lucas, Bjorn Java Bergenes, and Trusa Helvik. These men were the divers. Also in the chamber was William Crammond and Martin Saunders. These were the dive tenders who manned the diving bell. On the 5th of November 1983, Crammond connected the diving bell to the chambers and safely returned two divers into chamber one. The other two divers were waiting in chamber two. Before the diving bell could be detached, the living chambers needed to be sealed by the returning divers. On this day, however, the diving bell was detached without the chambers being sealed. This resulted in the immediate explosive decompression. The diving bell was blasted away with a huge change in pressure. Crammond was fatally injured and Saunders surviving with critical injuries. The four divers were instantly killed. The change in pressure boiled the nitrogen instantly. This violent eruption thankfully meaning the divers did not feel anything. Truser, the diver who was in the process of sealing the chamber, was pulled out of the chamber hatch. It was found that the hatch was opened by around two feet in diameter, and it was through this that his body was pulled. A number of Truser's body parts were found strewn all over the deck of the rig. Parts of his spinal cord were found over 30 feet from the explosive decompression. Truser's body had to be brought to the coroner in four plastic bags. The initial report into the incident placed the blame with the dive tenders that it was human error not following the correct procedures. Either through a mishearing or miscommunication, it was asserted the accident was the fault of the tenders. Little mention was made that the divers and tenders had been working for almost 13 hours straight, with dives that had regularly exceeded the maximum amount. But crucially, the setup of the diving bell and chambers was inherently dangerous. It ought not to have been possible for the diving bell to be disconnected when the chamber doors had been left open. However, a report in 2006 would confirm that it was the faulty equipment that was to blame. This in turn allowed the families of the divers to successfully sue the Norwegian government, who operated the rig some 25 years after the disaster. 
The use of improper equipment was caused by a rush to explore the region for valuable resources, with the safety of the divers coming second. This case highlights the dangers of working in such extreme environments, and just how vital proper safety equipment is to be provided for those putting their lives on the line.